and welcome to PM Express. And today we are looking at the Agogo clashes. For probably two decades and over, uh, Fulani or headsmen within the Agogo area and the indigenous of Agogo have had their clashes, but it looks as if they hit a crescendo when. Uh, Four security personnel were shot. Indeed, the chief of staff today issued a stern warning to the headsman that, listen, this is your line and do not cross it because next time we may retaliate equally. Indeed, it's one of the solutions that experts in the security field are saying is not as light as we see it and that it could degenerate into something way, way bigger than it is. History is clear today that yes, indeed, the lands belong to the Agogo people, which has been handed to them by the ancestors. But somehow, somehow, the, from the grapevine, there are security officers, big men in the country, even some chiefs from Agogo who own some of these cattle. So when the news started simmering, they couldn't nip it in the bud. So here we are now that they have the affront to shoot security personnel. What's the way forward? Can they literally leave the Agogo land and go anywhere? Should they find a way in which they stay together? How do we stop this menace from continuing? And that's the issue on the table today. My name, Nana Sakwa the fourth, chief of the Little Republic of Akomo de Masa. When I come back, we are looking at how it is we can resolve Agogo. Don't go. Well, thank you very much for staying and we're looking at the Agu clashes with me in the studio as our own in well PM Express security uh, consultant uh, you know our own in-house security consultant uh, Adam Bonner uh, security analyst Adam happy new year and welcome same to you good, I think, good. Uh, beginning of the year I haven't seen you no so, uh, no happy no new year so it's another new year to the team yes I was here yesterday to speak on attend the this uh, discovery of the explosives. Uh, okay, okay, uh, okay. Know, the, the, Israel, the, I think on your I see. seven o'clock, yeah. I see. I, I, I saw, uh, I mean, this is a little bit, you know, the sidetrack a little bit, but <laughs> I saw, I saw uh, <coughs> an article from the uh, Daily Graphic, which I thought was quite, uh, was quite funny. So uh, l l let me share it with you, and then, and then we'll come back to the uh, story now. It's, it's a piece in the Daily Graphic, and it says, Bomb sold. During interrogation, Ali said to have admitted being a member of ISIS in Libya, and that he sold a number of the grenade to some persons in some communities in various parts of the country. When the Daily Graphic visited Odoko police station, the grenades had been put under an entry <laughs> <laughs> instead of in a room for fear of them being expl <laughs> exploding. <laughs> I thought it was quite... <laughs> I don't know what name tree this is, but uh, it was quite funny. But uh, on a much more serious note, I mean, uh, Adam, yeah. for many, many years, you know, every now and then, every year, you hear the clash between these herdsmen and mainly farmers, you know, of, of Akogo. And now it's degenerated to a point where they now shoot at police men. The story says they actually ambushed them and shot them from behind. I mean, uh, is this something, I know it's something not to be taken lightly, but how serious is this? Yeah, once again, uh, good evening to your cherished PMS press viewers. Mm. Uh, I would say you, if you have to trace, you know, the genesis of this whole conflict, why would we want to say this land wars, I call them land wars. The land wars, I mean, started you know, uh, a while ago. The only thing we haven't done as a, as, as a people, as a nation, is to try and nip this in the bud. You realize, uh, even though we are talking about Google, if you, the major cities, uh, we have land guards either shooting at police officers or shooting at people who 
we have legitimate claim to most of these lands. And when you go outside Accra, you would have uh, either, you know, be either native or native over, you know, lands. And so one would have thought that uh, the money, those who manage these lands, those who own them, would, you know, put in structures to ensure that if you are coming in, these are, you know, our rules. These are the regime in place so that you don't have to flout the laws that govern these lands. And so uh, for these nomadic herdsmen, one would say that, yes, majority of us eat meat, but that is not to say, you know, the, these animals are more important than the humans. And so to, you know, in your intro, you did mention uh, who are the, just like the Galamse, you know, menace. Uh, you realize we had, you know, the so-called big men in our society who had invested, you know, huge sums of money into, you know, excavators and what have you. And they were just digging every, everywhere. They were just digging. And so it's the same as this uh, kettle. Most of these, you know, animals are owned by uh, people who might be some of the chiefs, who would be some, our some of our politicians and, you know, top executives in the country. And so uh, if you look at it, sometimes if you, you ask a question, I mean, you, you said it in your <coughs> intro, they shot at police officers, they shot at military officers. I mean, how did they know? that, you know, officers have been dispatched to come and probably uh, arrest them. I mean, somebody might have given them information. And I mean, and one other thing I have said repeatedly is that the intelligence set up in this country, either, uh, I mean, it's close to zero. And, and the simple reason is that uh, for all of these uh, shootings, I, I dare say we are still waiting for uh, the, the ballistic unit and the forensic unit of the Ghana Police Service or probably the National Security to tell us that for this shooting, this is the type of gun that was used. You know, identifying the weapon that was used help us to track who owns what. But at the end of the day, most of and some of them are using very sophisticated weaponry. And so it becomes very difficult uh, if you decide not to rob in the military, I mean, the military, they use different types of, you know, I mean, they have access to different types of, uh, you know, weaponry. And so one would say, uh, hearing the CDS, this, uh, this, this, I think I heard him on your network this afternoon. Uh, it, was, it was refreshing to hear him speak. I think we have somehow uh, domesticated our military officers. He spoke and I heard him repeat, we are going to operate within the law. We are going to operate within the law and we would have the right to self-defend ourselves if you dare attack us, which I thought was right. And usually I'm a bit skeptical when we have our military officers coming into town, you know, with, you know, they are not trained to deal with civilian, you know, issues. And so to hear him speak that way, I thought it was good enough to, you know, stop this, uh, mess that is going on in Agogo, you know, crops being destroyed here and there. And so uh, that is to put it that way, yes. Well, jo mm. Joining us on the phone later would be uh, Dr. Vladimir Echidansu, also a secu security analyst, uh, Andy Apia Kubi Asantia Kim MP, and then uh, Prince Jude Kobna, who's the head of Operation Kowleg, and then Ernest Ousu Bempa, uh, PRO of Ghana Gas and Indigen of Agogo. Uh, has been championing this anti-Fulani crusade for quite a while now. But before, let's hear what the CDS said today. The incident which happened on the 8th of this month, when people, and we are still investigating, and we shall get to the bottom of it, attacked soldiers and policemen who are doing a national duty here within the Agogo traditional area. We are called such an attack and I indicated when we met the traditional leadership that no such attack will go without the appropriate response. 
the response will be equal, it will be proportionate to the level of that assault, it will be unrelenting until we get the perpetrators, and we will continue to do that until peace and stability is established within this area. So the assurance that I'm giving to all of you is that no life of a soldier or of a policeman shall be exchanged for the life of a cutter. It will not happen. Consider that attack an attack on the state. The policemen and the soldiers were deployed under orders of government. So if anybody dared attack them, then they define the authority of government. It will be graduated depending on the level of attack. We will up our game. It will address the core problems of the traditional area. They cannot continue to act with impunity in the state of Ghana. Well, that was the CDS, and uh, b before the break, you, you, you spoke to it. Uh, he sounds serious. Yeah, he sounded serious, and, you know, those, who, those of us who listen to him and those who have uh, listened to him again uh, on your network, I think I would repeat again that it is interesting hearing him speak and using, saying that we are going to operate within the framework of the law. We won't allow anyone to take the laws into his own hands and act with impunity. We won't allow anyone to, you know, kind of uh, attack uh, the integrity of this country, which I thought was very important. In the past, you wouldn't hear uh, military couples, you know, uh, speaking this way. And so to hear him speak this way means that somehow I think we are doing well. Well, you see, what would say that? I mean, this issue is legendary uh, should we wait for you know security personnel to you know suffer this fate before this level of no you know importance? i think one thing we have failed to do as a nation and i would put that at the doorstep of our policy makers is to enact laws that would have you know i mean the ranching law we don't have it how many cattle do we have in this country we don't have uh, cattle more than, you know, a small country like <coughs> Norway. Mm. I mean, Norway is just small, but they have so much animals. But they have laws. I mean, these animals, and we don't have these laws in this country. Well, and I so but we still... we did, we obey. Because I know when you come in, apparently you have to register, you have to do this. There are some few regulations no, 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 that no, you have no, to follow. No, 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 the truth is, I see, if we had a policy frame, you know, a policy document, this, this ranching law I'm talking about, it's going to say, okay, we have this number of acreage of land and part of it. First of all, these animals would have to go through, you know, people's plantations and farms to be able to go and probably uh, graze and also drink water. They have to go to some water source to drink. And in doing that, they graze, destroy people's farms. And so if we were going to have this ranching law, within that catchment area, we would put in measures so that these animals don't stray. The, we are going to tag them using RFID tags. And so you can identify that in this, you know, uh, locality, we have, let's say, 20,000, you know, animals within this vicinity. And so, uh, and that probably would have brought, uh, we, we could have easily used this, this negativity, turn it into something positive. But unfortunately, well, I mean, we have to stop them. But as we stop them, where are they going to? I mean, that is the truth. On, the, on, on finding the truth, let me go to the phone and speak to Dr. Vladimir Enchi down. So, uh, Doc, you're welcome. Hello, Doc. Hello, thank you very much, Nana. Thank you, too, for uh, joining us on the phone. Uh, Doc, but the issue with Agogo and the headsmen, how complicated is this issue? Or how simple can we solve it? Well, I think it's extremely complicated because, one, we don't know who is the Fulani. We don't know who is the Ghanaian. We don't know who owns the cattle and that kind of thing. The point is this, that 
there are very prominent persons in this country who own the cattle. And any other person can be tendering the, you know, uh, can be a headsman, you know, heading the cattle. It could be an Ewe, a Kokomba, an Anumba. But as soon as we see the cattle, anybody following them is a Fulani. Gone were the days when we talk of Fulani coming only from Burkina Faso and we know they are foreign. But today, that situation has been completely uh, changed. Mm -hmm. And so the efforts we are making operation gone gone. As if we pull a new headsmen or alien whom we are trying to kick away from Ghana, it, it's false. Again, the head, the, the cattle head belongs to Ghana. They are the people who supply the arms to the so-called Fulani. They are the people who supply everything to them. And I believe that we're using the kinetic method, that is, just using brutal force. And the cattle will be heading towards wherever their needs are, water, green grass, and the herdsmen will be following them. So I think beyond the operation uh, cow leg, we should also use methods like systematizing cattle really in Ghana, the crowd, the ranching method. If we do that and we know the the people who own them, then veterinary services and other services will be extended to them. But the way we are handling them, soon after the cow leg is over for a period, we still have this menace. And more importantly, it is complicated by chiefs and other persons who sell their land, as if as it were, or grazing period, to these so-called people. So I strongly suspect that the methodology is wrong, the cattle owners are Ghanaian. The headsmen are not just ex uh, external Fulani people, but Ghanaian. And we must use the right uh, in getting them out. People are written about them. Professor Sistona has a lot about the Fulani and what can be done about that. But it looks as though we ignore this and we use some political means to try and solve the problem. And we come face to face with the problem any, any and every time again. Well, look, listening to you, then basically we, we, we are stuck with it because if they are mainly Ghanaians, if some of the chiefs uh, own the cattle, uh, then they, they have nowhere to go. And if we don't have a ranching law like uh, uh, was said earlier, then they, they are left to roam. That's the point I'm making that, look, the methodology is wrong. We still need the cattle in Ghana. We need, still need our protein content of our. I mean, food security, we don't have to be importing this fat laden kind of uh, meat from abroad all the time. We need to have our own, uh, beef up our own kind of nutritional or whatever it is from, from the cattle. But we must have a methodology of, of, of having them. Those days, as I remember, when the cattle came only from Burkina Faso mostly, and Kuma had a, a kind of agreement with Yamiogo, that is the president then of Upper Volta where the cattle had some corridors where they entered Ghana from. And then uh, we had veterinary officers attending to them, and they came all the way to that place, uh, largely unpopulated then. And they grazed <coughs> until March, April. As they went back, 60% of the cattle were sold to Ghana. And that is how come we got the Bolgatanga meat factory or the Pualugu, whatever it is. And then we also got the skin the hide for the canning factory in Kumasi, and then the Batashi factory in Kumasi. So that was a good methodology of trying to diffuse whatever tensions that would have uh, arisen as a result of cattle rearing. But today, the situation has changed. Can't we have a different method of rearing cattle, and can't we systematize them? As I said, a lot many prominent Ghanaians, senior military officers, senior police officers, senior whatever, can be lecturers, can be chiefs, and whatnot, they are predominantly owned by Ghanaians, not by Fulani ethnic. Uh, Doc, now they have the you know, brave enough or the infantry to now shoot at uh, security personnel. So then what next? I mean, the ordinary farmer, you know, do you yeah, grow? It, it, I mean, it, if I've shot it, at a soldier, who are you? Yeah, it, it, it's part of the indiscipline we have generally in this country. The disrespect for the law, uh, the general indiscipline. Uh, you know, it's an unfortunate situation. So that is why I said, yeah, you think it's correct, but not enough. I mean, um, force can be, can, be, can be applied in or against force. So it is good that we showed them that this is wrong. But beyond that, there must be something to be done so that we, 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 don't, we don't experience this thing. Generally, people now don't hear anything. They, 
they, they take the law into their own hands because it is extremely uh, mind-boggling that uh, somebody destroying a farm would have the effrontery of taking the gun, not only shooting the farm owners, but also, I mean, attacking police and, and the military. It, 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 we've gone too far. We need to do something about it. I mean, last year, 18 people lost their lives, and I hear the count is, I think, about 57, you know, people who've dead uh, directly in conflict about this. I mean, uh, have we waited too long to act? I, I think so. We've waited far too long. As I said, you see, it's because everything is political. I can, I can assure you that a lot many cattle owners are politicians or support politicians. And therefore, taking the right measures um, has been a difficulty in this country. I strongly suspect that if the government uh, has the correct measurement of issues in, in applying those uh, measurements together with the kinetic method, that is using force, I think these things will die down. We need the ranching system. We need adequate laws. We need things that should go beyond what we are seeing to be able to uh, because we need the cattle, we need the beef, but at the same time, we can't go the way we are going. Wow. Well, thank you very much. That was Dr. Vladimir Entridan. So, uh, Adam, yeah. it's, it's a bit scary, though. I mean, it's like, look, they are here to stay, so you find a way to live with them. Yeah, yes, we, we, we've got to make laws. We've got to, we've got to make laws and we've got to put in, you know, structures to ensure, like, I mean... Uh, well, is it, is it apart from the laws, Adam, I mean, there, there's the... Let me say common sense that look, if you've planted your plantain, I don't bring my cows to come and eat your plantain. Whether there was laws or not, I mean, this has basic human understanding. So even if we pass the law today that okay, f from today onwards, don't take your cows to go and eat Adam's farm. However, your farm is probably five kilometers out of town in the bush. You know, I can't be there 24 hours. And who, who's watching? And how do we know that they are in there? And how do we even know that it was cow A or cow B? that, you know, came in there at night to destroy my farm? Well, the truth is, uh, just like I said, you see, in other places, these animals, are ta they are tagged. You put, you, you know, tag them with, you know, RFID mm. tags. So you can locate like, them. So you can locate them. You, you, don't, you don't have to be in the crowd. You don't have to be in that ranch to be able to count them. You just, the click of a button, you can tell this crowd or this ranch has, you know, 50,000 or, you know, 1,000, you know, animals in there. And so this law would have helped us be able to do that. And so you would not dare begin to rear these animals if you haven't followed this process. So you would be issued a permit. And, we, and you know, it would have brought us a lot of revenue. And so I would urge the, the current administration. We, the current administration is, you know, telling us one district, one factory. Mm -hmm. And so I think we can incorporate this idea of this ranching. If we can do that, somebody, remember somebody would have to plant the hay, the, 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 yep. the, the, the you know, mm -hmm. the food this cattle would have to eat. And somebody would have to own probably the dam where they would have to drink from. Somebody would have to probably clean the cow dung. Somebody might use that for manure. And so you see, and if we can do it and do it well, at the moment we are importing meat from all over the world and so I would have wished that instead of looking at this from a negative point we rather would turn this into something very positive that would bring us huge foreign estate because in doing that if we have excess meat we can export but at the moment majority of the meat we eat in this country is imported into the country yeah. and so why can't we rather turn this into something positive we aren't doing that and remember I I am aware that most of these herdsmen don't speak any of our native languages. I have accosted, I have, you know, encountered some of them, and you speak to him. Either he decides he understands the language and decides not, pretend not to understand you, and so that is where the conflict starts from. I'll tell you what, on my way let to... Me, let, let me take a quick break and then come back. And then uh, adding to uh, yours to find out, it's their culture to basically be normal and roam about. If we start confining the cows and bringing hay, are they ready to show their culture of, you know, roaming the fields and now confining the cows? We'll, we'll, we'll come and talk about that. And then when we come back, we'll listen to uh, Dr. Kwesi Enin's uh, take on this issue. Don't go
couple of days, we've heard about the farmer header crisis. This once more relates to the wild promises that we're giving of boreholes and of dams and of ensuring that this problem will be wiped up once and for all. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the farmer header crisis is a consistent failure over time of the political intrusion in the decision making processes of the security councils in where these cattle are. The violent approach by the state of Ghana in seeking to resolve this has failed and will continue to fail. But that failure is not just about farmers and herders. That's, that failure is being transformed into a narrative of victimhood, of dispossession, and of exclusion. These clashes have become a perennial problem in this country because I argue that we do not appear to be getting it right. It's become emotional, it's become politicized, and it's driven by short-term political and economic gains. The present strategy of following the shoot to kill is an even much more dangerous strategy. Fulanis are the second largest single ethnic group in West Africa and across the, the Sahel Belt. We've got to be careful we don't turn this into a mega Africa-wide international crisis. Because I'm not look, hearing the international side. If all Fulani in, in other African countries where they form a majority decide to turn on Ghanaians, Operation Cowleg, driven by a shoot and kill the cattle strategy, is confrontational, it's dangerous, it's aggravating the problem, and as I've said, it's leading to this narrative of exclusion, victimhood, and dispossession. That's a different dimension to the topic. Thank you for staying. Uh, do, do you share his view? Uh, not entirely. Mm -hmm. Not entirely because uh, there is no ethnic group in Ghana, uh, you know, which we can actually classify, which you can classify as a Fulanese. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, if you are from the mountains, and so uh, Fulani, originally, we don't have Fulanese who, uh, I mean, they migrated and came in, and so I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't, I don't share everything he said. There is a problem and we've got to confront the problem. You know, in dealing with this type of crisis, we have a short-term uh, measure, and then you would want to have a medium to long-term measure. And so in the interim, uh, if you believe it this way, probably it's going to degenerate into, you don't also want a situation where we begin to have uh, pockets of, uh, you know, probably civil conflict within the Agogo area, or where this, uh, I mean, People within that area who either to didn't have didn't want to own guns started arming because then they, bec they became afraid to go to farms. <coughs> they, you know, the the uh, women were being <coughs> raped here and there. And so, as as a country, I mean, one would want to say what we are doing. Probably, I wouldn't say. I mean, the violent confrontation wouldn't solve the problem. But then we've got to send a signal to the Fulani. I, I wouldn't want to. I mean, I wouldn't want to say full and but the headsmen that you see, you cannot act with impunity and continue to act with impunity and as a state who will sit and be looking at you to, you know, raping and destroying, you know, the way we, we, we have always lived. And so I think that, uh, yes, I share in some of the things you said, but largely uh, saying, yeah, I mean, even in Nigeria, we have an ethnic group, the, the largest ethnic, I mean, Fulani ethnic, the Fulani tribe, they are in Nigeria, you'll find the most of them yeah, so in that's Nigeria. That's why saying that, you know, if, if you, you know, had one or two Fulani guys here, then areas where there are more Fulanese will then target Ghanaians who are there as the well. You Ghanians I don't I don't think so. I think I think a week or two weeks ago there was violent confrontation between I think around the Kaduna area in Nigeria, where Fulanese, you know, uh, the people killed Fulanese, Fulanese killed them. And so this war has been raging, especially, I mean, what we are seeing here is just a, a tip of the iceberg as compared to what is happening in Nigeria. And so I wouldn't want to say uh, we should 
we, we should leave them to you know continue to perpetuate the, this uh, atrocities on on, uh, on on us. I mean, yes, uh, they are. They might be the second or the third largest ethnic whatever mm -hmm. in, in the West in, in West Africa. But that is not to say we should watch them uh, do what they are doing. Rather, I would urge that the rhetoric from our politicians must stop. Well, on the, on the note no, no of politician, let me go straight to a politician, and that's uh, Andy Apia Kubi, who is an uh, honorable member of parliament for Asantia Kim North. Uh, Andy, you're welcome. Thank you, my brother. Uh, this is not good news for you in your jurisdiction. Well, uh, we're seeking our freedom, so uh, what could be better than uh, seeking uh, world freedom? Sure. But, I mean, uh, do, do you see an end to this? Because, indeed, they have nowhere to move the cattle to. And you have no space for them to stay. So then what happens? You are saying that they have to go somewhere? Hello? Yeah, let, let, I think I can hear you now. Hello? 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 Andy, can you hear me? Andy, okay, I think we'll, we'll try and get the we'll get a better line. We'll try and get a better line. Uh, that was the, uh, the 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 MP, but sorry, I cut. Yes, there. yes. Basically, what I'm saying is that we, I mean, I can see this uh, the 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 app, the, the police, com military up in their game is to send a strong signal to those who are probably taking the law. I mean, for me, I think they, they is have been... Is this they, selfish? They, 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 they've been so daring to the point that they ambushed, I mean, our security. Uh, those who are licensed to... Uh, the state has licensed them to carry arms. They ambushed them, you know, shot them, killed. Uh, I mean, wounded some of them, you know. And so I would say that we've got to let them know that you cannot continue to act with impunity. But... I, I mean, I wanted to hear what the MP would say because the rhetoric has, has been ongoing for how many years now? I mean, every year this issue would come up again. And unfortunately, the politicians, after talking, will run to Accra where we have less animals and they live in their air-conditioned offices and air-conditioned rooms. And it is our uh, mothers and, you know, family in the villages who go through these atrocities. And so I, would, I wanted to hear what the Honorable Member of Parliament mm -hmm. in that area would say. And also, we shouldn't just be interested in getting rid of them because if you are going to get rid of them, I'm told some of them are cutting their animals in trucks and all that. Are they crossing the, our borders and going into neighboring countries or they are moving them to another area where another conflict is going to start? And so I would have wished that cool heads would rain, would calm down, and probably quickly mobilize and put in resources and say, okay, this is what we want to do. I mean, after all, uh, the president saw the need and cabinet, they put together this uh, uh, special prosecutor thing has been passed and somebody has been appointed. I am saying that some of these uh, policies and some of these laws are more important than the, uh, some of this uh, special prosecutor thing they did. Seriously speaking, because these people, our, you know, natives who, our people who are in Agogo are suffering. They've been suffering for a very long time. And it's not only limited to Agogo. We have them in other areas, even in Accra. Go to the, the Nima, uh, you know, I mean, you encounter these animals in... On my way to Ho, I think 2014, I encountered these headsmen, and I realized a couple of them were wearing ballistic vests. I mean, it tells you how this thing has been, and so, and I realized they were crossing from maybe the Togo area, and they are just coming, and they were wearing ballistic vests. And you know how they come? They carry either their AK 47s, they don't wear them, but they have them in rack sacks. Okay, they have them in rucksacks, and they hang them in some of the the, the, the lead. Uh, I mean, the, the lead animal. We, we we got the MP back. I hear he's in Burkina Faso. Hence, the uh, line is a bit bad. But let's try again and see. Uh, hello, Andy. You're welcome. Hello, thank you, my brother. I'm oh, sorry, you. I've uh, returned from uh, National Assembly to Burkina Faso, so I'm driving. That is why you're not uh, getting me right. I think I, I've got to take this call. Sir, thank you very much. Anyway, what, what's going to be the way forward between the headsmen and the indigents of Agogo? What, what's, the, what's the way forward? But I was uh, getting ready to answer your question, the first question, that they 
have nowhere to go. Is that the case? Was that the question you asked? Yeah, that's what I, that's the question I asked. That you know, where, where have they got to go? Uh, but why do you think that they have to point themselves on that? You don't know that uh, for you to be able to have possession of any part of land, you need to apply it properly. That you cannot possibly uh, encroach upon somebody's land or trespass upon somebody's land and decide to take it by force and do what you want on that person's land without recourse to the owner of the land and at the peril of the owner of the land. Is that the right way of acquiring land? The answer to these uh, questions are all those things. You cannot possibly enter somebody's land and purport to possess it and use it anyhow that you want. You can't do that. That is a law in the first place. So the amount of purported activity is wrong and it's unlawful. So they cannot uh, possibly come onto somebody's land and then turn around and ask the where do I go? It is, uh, it, 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 it is not right. So that question I cannot answer. I don't need to tell them where to go. They want to do their own business. And for them to do their own business, they should know how to plan the business. And planning the business means that you should find a place to live and do your business. You cannot say that because I want to do business, I enter somebody's house and I'll do business there. You can't do that. So I don't have any responsibility to go to the go. They are the people who have to decide where the law will allow them to stay. And pursue uh, that agenda. They need to do that which is lawful for them to be able to acquire a place and settle and live and possess and do their business. It is not my business to show them where to go. All that I say is that I'm protecting my best right. Thank that you. That is the place that I come from and that's the place where I live and that's the place where I do my business and I have every right to do my business. The right belongs to me and that Well, thank you very much. Line was a bit uh, terrible there. But, you know, in general, what he's saying is that, look, uh, they should have somewhere to go because of the line. But my follow-up question was going to be, normally they would come on the land because they would have asked that, look, yeah. can we come and graze on this patch? And then they stray away and from And they it. even pay for some of this land, yeah. you know. They so, pay. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, I think uh, I would have wished they... I don't MP know what the situation is there now if these people just straight onto the land or if they paid I, I, I mean know. I mean from from indication from some I mean of the intelligence some of us have guided some of these lands in, in fact these people have paid for them and they have you know they will show you documentations <laughs> of the you know saying I have I I can be I've been given this land I have a lease for let's say 20, 30 years to be on this land, mm -hmm. you know, uh, once the lease would, I mean, it's still valid. And so I would have wished that uh, the MP, the member, I mean, I mean, th this, is, is, this, this is a very important person in this country. Mm -hmm. And they are supposed to be making laws to protect, you know, uh, both the, the, those who own the animals and then the farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the, the crop farmer. And so for him to say that he doesn't really, literally, that's what he said. He doesn't care what they carry, where they cut the animals to. You, you I'm sure you have a member of parliament. You mm -hmm. are from a particular, uh, mm -hmm. you know, geographical area, you sure. know, in Tema. I also have uh, an MP. And so if you are saying that uh, the animals with, from my area, it's okay to go into another uh, MPs area and you don't care instead of saying that well as members of parliament why shouldn't we put in measures to make sure that this mess that is going on it stops so that we rather benefit from the mess but you see uh, probably is the reason why sometimes other world leaders would call us names because I am thinking that we could have largely benefited from turning this you know, overly negative see, that's, thing that's, into positive. See, that's what I was asking about their culture. They have a habit of this grazing and walking and grazing and walking. If you suddenly say, look, let's confine these animals, let somebody do bay, you go and buy the hay and feed them. I mean, is this something they're going to say? Okay, it it to has do. nothing, you see, it has nothing to do with culture. Let me be honest with you. Mm. Let's not sound a bit xenophobic. 
and being mm. charitable here. Headsmen, I mean, those who head cattle are not, you can't say they are only from the Fulani tribe. So let's be, let's be careful mm -hmm. the way I'm saying this because, you see, we have universities in this country, students finish with, you know, degrees in animal husbandry. And so the truth is that if we put in policies, we are going to have people who doesn't necessarily have to be from a Fulani tribe you know, trying to own some of these animals and, leave, you know, having them in ranches because then but it's becoming profitable. Uh -huh. But the moment we don't have policies, you know, document, we don't have a way to ensure that these animals don't stray, they don't destroy, there's no conflict, then it then becomes possible for... But, but I don't know, nomads, I mean, nomads, that's their culture to graze and grow and stay... But if, if, you, if, you, if you have... If you have Laws that are working, if you have laws that are working, you are going to domesticate the, that, norm, uh, that uh, headsman. You will domesticate him. Because then, remember, I'm sure you know that, uh, is it about 15, 15, 17 years ago, it became a law that you have to be able to speak English before you will be given a British passport. I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to speak English. And you would have to, you know, uh, you know, that. yeah, you have to write tests. You need to do a lot of things before you be given. You you would be accepted as you know a British national. That is what that is what I call a place where structures work. But over here, uh, if we decide to tell this angle where we say, well, uh, this are how this is their culture. So are you telling me that we don't have Fulanis in in Britain and in America? No, we should have them. They're everywhere. And so when they go to America, I'm sure they behave like you would have to conform to the laws. Mm -hmm. And so when they are here, it is because even us, even us, I mean, it's so chaotic in this country. And so the truth is that we must make sure the laws work. When this uh, anti galamse Tax Force was put in place. I'm sure you realize how the young people and those who were into it started agitating. Do you hear of the agitation again? Everything is died down. And so we are told in six months, you know, they are going to be, if we are not very careful, we don't put in, you know, proper measures, we are going to go back to it again. And so this issue about uh, Fulani, Hesmen, and nomadics who are roaming and grazing and destroying everything, it is because the rhetorics have been too much. The rhetorics have just been too much. Just like you said, mm -hmm. I would have wished that the MP would say, we have, I mean, the executive or there's something in cabinet mm -hmm. that is, we are, is going through whatever and we want to pass this law. We want to make sure that uh, maybe one district, one dam, one this, one. Because listen, these animals must drink. They might, they would go through somebody's farm to go to that dam to go and drink. They would go through somebody's cassava, they would, you know, and so if we fail to put in these measures, mm -hmm. then we, next year, this issue, this issue is going to come up. And remember, the borders are so porous. I'm sure now you yeah. know, and our listeners know. And so if you stop these people, those within, what about those who are coming? Because the ECOWAS protocol, do you understand me? These guys are coming from Nigeria, they are coming from Benin, they are coming from Togo, they are coming from Burkina, Mali, Niger, from the Sahel. They are coming. And so if we don't put in measures, we don't put in surveillance, we don't do things that will stop these people from coming, you would, you would stop them. And remember, we have, we've had a lot of uh, you know, uh, armed robberies on our highways. And it is because these people, when they come, they are in the thick forest. I mean, they are in the bush where you and I would not believe there are human beings there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't even know they've strayed into that area until they, the heads begin to grow and begins to grow and they begin to destroy. Then we realize, oh, they've been there for uh, five years. How Adam, did they come? Adam, should we start the peace talks? Because now it looks as if the relationship between the headsmen and the indigents are really, really damaged. Traditional leaders are angry. Now security personnel are angry. So there's a lot of bad blood. Should we start the peace talks now? Yes, we should have started long ago. I mean, I would, you know, violence on violence has never 
helped. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would have both parties, everyone, you would always have losers. And so we should have probably the Peace Council. I mean, we have the Peace Council, the Christian Council, the Imams. We sh let's have, I mean, I think we would have to unite together with the, these headsmen and tell them that you see, not that we don't, we don't want you to probably uh, run your business. What we are saying is that we must sit and this is how we want you to run the business. And so I would have wished that Nana, just like you mentioned, the peace talk should have started long ago. Because at the moment, they are shooting. We are told about 120 uh, animals have been shot, dead, or maybe more in the last whatever. As to whether I tried checking, but I think the information I had was a bit scanty. And so I don't want to add to the mm. speculation. But the truth is that these people have been able, I mean, they are shooting at security personnel. No lives should be lost because uh, someone wants to rear his animal, somebody wants to farm, and therefore there's conflict. So the P, there should have been, we should have, we have to find a way to, you know, mediation. Let's mediate, let's find a way, an amicable solution to, instead of saying, you know, you've got to leave. Because from what the MP but see, said. If, if, if I own the land and you find your cattle there, at, why, why should I, by all means, live with you? I don't want to no, live with you. Who, who says you own the land? My point is that, Nana, if you lease your land to me for 30 years, do you come back and tell me that within that time, you still own the land? It's a question. If you lease your land to me willingly, I'll pay you for 30 years to have my, cast, my cattle graze on that land. Mm -hmm. And you come back. And the truth is that, you know, for the way, I mean, this is the truth. Mm -hmm. they, we, this land, the farmers usually would go and see some chief, and the chief says, well, they don't really pay the chiefs. And so the chief will say, okay, you, you can farm. And usually, because the chiefs themselves don't go there to measure the land and give it to these farmers, they increase probably the acreage, they increase it. And so the Fulani headsman come, or the, 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 the headsman comes and says, I want, can you give me maybe 100 acres? I want to have my animals on this land. And then maybe some paperwork leaves aside. Mm -hmm. The guy takes his animals there. And then the next thing, you hear the farmers probably complaining that my crops have been destroyed. And so you see, we cannot deal with this issue and leave out the chiefs. Because the chiefs, most of this lands belong to the chiefs and probably the, 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 the elders of our community. And so once you have given me, and the truth is that probably is one thing we are probably not also looking at. <laughs> the headsman probably has not been able to tell his own story. Because probably if we would pay a bit of attention to the headsman, then we would know that probably the, the, there is some... The, the, we have to begin to reason with them because if you've rented or you've leased your land to me, I've rented your house for two years, you have no right to come in there and tell me to get out of the land without paying me any form of compensation. Mm -hmm. It's against the law. And so whereas we are telling them See, they can't destroy our crops, I, I, I we know. are also perpetuating so, an illegality probably. So why, why does the issue of straying out of your confined leased land. How, how does it apply? So who, my, you see, the, I, I, I want us to understand this. At what point do they stray? I mentioned earlier, just a few well, minutes I mean, ago. You know they at go. what point, at what point, you've given me 100 acres. Mm -hmm. And somebody's farming you, and, and and you've given me, you've given me, acres. no, you've given me 100 acres. And you didn't know that the 100 acres you gave me Probably you had already given someone 20 acres, and the person had strayed, the person had rather strayed earlier on before I came into that 100 acres you J gave judging me. From the, judging from the venom on the ground, I think there is more cattle straying into farms rather than farms it, it, straying it, it into... It is possible, it's possible. But what I'm trying to say is that we cannot deal with this issue holistically mm -hmm. without looking at both sides. But what we are doing as a nation is just dealing, the, is, is the cheapest way to, the cheapest well, way see, of dealing I, with I, the I, issue I, is the I way think, we are and going. And I think that apart from, apart from the strain, you know, the issue of rape and attacks and, you know, violence. That, exactly. That is the most unfortunate thing, just like I said. In other places, if we had probably a regulation, a law that regulate how we, these animals are reared in this country, probably... Uh, these people 
you must have a permit to probably rear these animals or herd the cattle in this country. And so when probably I come in and I speak tree to you, you should be able to respond. And so I think that somehow these people have found the, the headsmen. Some of them have found an easy way of raping our women and harming them and shooting them and doing what they have to do because as a nation, we have not, you know, done what is expected, expected of us. And so the conversation is going to continue, continue. and I hope that uh, instead of the knee-jerk approach to dealing with this issue, have a proper plan we'll it. have a proper plan and make it profitable to all of us and then let's earn some foreign exchange from these uh, animals instead of, you know, uh, the confrontation. Well, let me say big, big uh, thank you to Tanti's Fashion who makes my shirt. So if you want uh, a nice shirt like I'm wearing, uh, the number is 024. 366-2001-024-366-2001 Tantiza Fashion and they will get you a nice shirt. Let me take this opportunity to, to say thank you to GTP. Uh, they gave the little princess 10 pieces of GTP cloth. I'm on TV and they're giving the baby a cloth. But thank you anyway, GTP. <laughs> Can you imagine?